practical reason for why this entire conference is devoted to the topic of sin. I suggested to the team last summer that we consider this because I was reading the new book by Stephen Westerholm on the justification reconsidered. And I was deeply moved by chapters 2 and 3 on the relationship between sin and the doctrine of justification. Westerholm is dealing with the new perspective on Paul, which you don't need to have even heard about to understand this message, so I'm going to just give you a glimpse of why that matters and see if I can take you with me to what happened to me as I was reading these chapters. In the last 50 years or so in New Testament scholarship, there's been this movement called the New Perspective on Paul, and the gist of it goes like this. For the last 500 years or more, especially in the Protestant church, there has been a significant, fairly profound misunderstanding of the nature of first century Judaism and what it believed about grace and works. And therefore, because we had gotten first century Judaism wrong, we got Paul wrong in the way we understood how he was responding to the Jewish believers or unbelievers of his day. And the mistake was, we thought Paul viewed first century Judaism that he was interacting with as legalistic and earning their way to God's favor through the doing of works of the law, when in fact, Judaism, the new perspective says, was profoundly a religion of grace. There was sacrifice and atonement and forgiveness and free election, and therefore it's a distortion to caricature the first century Judaism as a religion of law or legalism, graceless, when in fact it had a very profound doctrine of Grace. So, when we read in Galatians chapter 2 something like this, Paul, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So, we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We are not to understand Paul in a text like that attacking legalists who thought that by works of the law they could find their way into favor or a right standing with God. Now, I'm not going to take you into the details of the alternative understanding of first century Judaism and what Paul was doing there because it would get way out of control and be very confusing as it remains for me in many ways. So what I do want to do, however, is give you enough of Westerholm's interaction to show what happened to me in dealing with sin in Paul with his help. Even the most seminal thinker in the New Perspective, namely E.P. Sanders, who wrote Paul and Palestinian, Palestinian Judaism, published in America in 1977, and the one who more effectively than anybody else got this view going, even Sanders admits that though there is a real, true, profound doctrine of grace in first century Judaism, how could there not be since they're rooted in the 
Old Testament. Nevertheless, quote, grace and merit did not seem to them to be in contradiction to each other. Grace and works were not considered alternative roads to salvation, unquote. That's a quote from Westerholm's analysis of Sanders' understanding. So, for Paul, reliance on grace for a right standing with God seemed to rule out reliance on all works, nevertheless for first century Judaism, even for E.P. Sanders, it didn't. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision, this is Paul, Galatians 5, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. So for Paul, one baby step into reliance upon something as inconsequential as circumcision obligates you to be perfect or fail. Paul wasn't a mixer of works and grace as the foundation of a right standing with God. But the founder of the new perspective, E.P. Sanders, shows that though Judaism had a doctrine of grace, it did not give it the same role and the same prominence that that doctrine had for Paul. Why not? Why did Paul elevate grace to such a point where there could be not the slightest mixture with any works as the foundation for our standing with God? Why did he do that? And the answer is that Paul had a much more radical view of sin than did mainstream Judaism in his day. The reason that Paul did not think any good works could make the slightest contribution to the foundation of our acceptance with God is that among unregenerate, unjustified people, there aren't any. None. And even the good works of the justified are imperfect and therefore can't contribute anything even after we're born again to the foundation of our right standing with God. Here's what Sanders says. So the, the representative of the new perspective says, quote, the rabbis did not have a doctrine of original sin or of the essential sinfulness of each man in the Christian sense. So here's the crucial thing. The reason Paul preached justification by grace alone, through faith alone, on Christ alone, is that he had a doctrine of sin that made any other possibility non-existent. There wouldn't be any salvation, justification, had he not preached that way. But the Judaism of his day lacked such a profound, deep, pervasive, essential, original doctrine of sin that made it impossible to even conceive of there being any such thing as a good work which could put you into right standing with God. So here I am sitting in Knoxville, Tennessee, 
at my window on the second floor last summer being devastated and gloriously refreshed by these words from Westerholm's summary of chapter 2. Quote, Paul's depiction of humanity's condition required a much more rigorous dependence on divine grace than did Judaism's. It is no caricature. That's what the new perspective was so concerned about, the caricaturing of the first century Judaism. It is no caricature of Judaism to say with Sanders that it lacked a doctrine of the essential sinfulness of humankind. No Jew would regard that claim as an insult. For Paul, on the other hand, it is precisely the essential sinfulness of humankind that requires a salvation based on grace alone, apart from all human works. And I recall pausing as I read that paragraph and asking myself, do I know my condition? Do I know what essential John Piper sinfulness even is? Do I have a grasp of what it is about me that requires the death of the God-man for me to be saved? Do I have any suitable notion or affection concerning my own evil? And that is somehow proportionate to what it cost to rescue me from it. It was a shaken moment. That's where the conference came from. And just to complete the illustration, therefore, the old perspective on Paul, clarified, heralded in the Reformation, is not fundamentally mistaken. Yes, there is grace in first century and all Judaism. Yes, there is atonement, repentance, forgiveness. But no, this does not rule out for them the mingling of good works and grace as the basis of our standing, our right standing with God. One thing rules that out. Namely, we are so sinful, there is no such thing as a good I'll defend that statement shortly. But at this point, last summer, I felt the weight doctrinally and I felt the weight personally. Doctrinally, it struck me in a way that had not happened in a long time, maybe never, that if I don't see, if I don't see the nature and the depth and the power and the extent of sin, my sin, biblical understanding of sin, I'm going to get justification wrong. I'm going to get it wrong. And not only am I going to get justification wrong, I'm going to get almost everything wrong. What happened on the cross? What happens in conversion? What happens in faith? 
and repentance. What happens in the living of the fist and wife and the, and the warfare against sin? What happens in perseverance? What happens in heaven? Will I be able to endure? What happens everywhere is affected by, do I even know me? Do I know this disease? And then personally, as well as doctrinally, it was very, very powerful. Every one of us who've been believers, like me, what? Do the math quick here, 53 years. No, 63 years. I believe that I put my faith in Christ at age six. 63 years I've been a Christian. Sin is horrible at age 69. The bent towards selfishness. The bent towards pride. The bent towards indolence. The bent towards lust. I don't need you to show me your sinfulness to know what I'm dealing with. All I need is a mirror or a conscience. So, watching him show why justification by grace alone is the only way there will be any justification was a terrible indictment to me and a wonderful liberation. And I'm praying the same thing for you. My aim, that's all introduction <laughs> as to why we're here doing what we're doing. My aim in this message is to define sin. The title is a little misleading. I forget what I put. Origin, nature, power, something. It's just nature. Okay. Def what is it? That's all I have time to do. I thought I would do more, but no. What is sin? What is the essence and the root? Let's just go, let's go straight to the root. I want to know what sin at the bottom, root, under the tree of sinning, is with that. I want to know what that is. So that's where we're going. Humans are so sinful, apart from the grace of God in Christ, that we cannot do any good works at all. I will come back shortly to argue for that biblically because it sounds outrageous as it stands. It's a pressing question. Do you believe that? No, you don't. And you do. You, don't you believe that an unbeliever can build a hospital? An unbeliever can keep the speed limit. An unbeliever can negotiate national peace. An unbeliever can, can fight Ebola, even risk his life. An unbeliever can feed the poor. An unbeliever can pay a fair wage. Is that good? It's good. So what in the world do I mean, or we Westerholm? You are not capable of any good. We know that not just you use the vocabulary of good that way, and the world does, the Bible does. Romans 13, 3, rulers are not a terror to good conduct. So there's something out there called good conduct, but too bad. Would you have no fear of them? Do what is good, and you will receive their approval. You and the Bible call keeping the speed limit good. 
and building hospitals and working to find healing for cancer and leukemia and Ebola. That's good. So to quote Westerholm again, what did he mean when he said, quote, human beings are incapable of doing good works. And why do I agree with him? The most penetrating and extensive treatment of sin in the Bible, I think, is the first three chapters of the book of Romans. And even where the word sin is not occurring there, we know that's what it's talking about because when he gets to the end of his analysis of the human condition in chapter 3, verse 9, he says this, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. That's the charge of Romans 1 to 3. Or the next verse makes clear what he means. Verse 10 of Romans 3. None is righteous. No, not one. And verse 12, even more. No one does good. Not even one. That's the conclusion of the analysis of Paul in Romans 1, 2, and 3. So if you have a Bible or a phone, open it to Romans 1, because the rest of this message is rooted here. What I want to know is what is the essence of sin? in Romans 1 to 3. What's at the bottom of all sinning? What makes all sinful actions sinful? What's wrong with me at my core that gives rise to so many different kinds of evil? And you might say, Why do you even think that way? Why do you even pose such a question? Why don't you just assume what we do is sin? Why why do you insist on even shaping the discussion that way? That there's doing and then there's roots. There's, There's nature, there's depravity. What do you... Reform people talk about depravity. Why don't we just talk about the things you do to hurt people or dishonor God are wrong. That's sin. Why do you go down here? And the answer is because Paul does. And he doesn't just do it incidentally. He does it rigorously and intensely and repeatedly in chapter 1. Way more than I thought he did as I was getting ready for this. And because he says things like this elsewhere, Romans 7 verse 8, sin, seizing opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Well, covetousness is a sin. It's the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet. If your heart is a coveting heart, you are sinning. But what he says is, sin, taking opportunity in the commandment, produced covetousness. So sin produces sin. Right? And I want to know, sin number one, who are you? What are you? I know this one well. I know the fruit. I know the tree. I want to know you, Mr. Sin producing sin. 
that's what I'm after because Paul really, really cares about that. And evidently then he thinks it's very, very important that we go beneath our sinning to our sin. What's the bottom of all my evils and yours? So let's start at verse 18, chapter 1, and notice a sequence of relationships that are remarkable, repetitive, and remarkable. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So here mankind in general is described as ungodly and unrighteous. John, 1 John 5, 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. Adikia is hamartia. So we know what we're dealing with here. To all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who, what's the first thing they do? They suppress the truth. Our ungodliness and unrighteousness inclines us to suppress truth. We repel the light. We run into darkness. Jesus said in John 3 that we are guilty sinners, not because we're victims of darkness, but lovers of darkness. I'll read it to you. John 3, 19. Light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light. So right off the bat, I'm getting the feeling, okay, deep down in me, issues are love issues. I love the dark. I can suppress the truth so much more easily in the dark. And that's what sin does. It suppresses truth. What truth does it specialize in suppressing? Verse 19, because what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Knowledge of God is the truth that sin wants to suppress. So he says, therefore we have no excuse. Verse 20, middle of the verse, so they are without excuse. Verse 21, why? Because although they knew, they knew God, they did not glorify Him or give Him thanks. So the root of why we suppress the truth is that we don't want to glorify or thank God. And the truth is always testifying to His glory and His beneficence, and so it has to be squished down, put out of our mind, lest we feel guilty about not glorifying and thanking Him. We don't want to do it because we're sinners, and sin doesn't thank God. Sin doesn't glorify God. Sin loves darkness, which conceals the glory of God and the beneficence of God. Sin is not just a hater of the light and of the knowledge of God desiring to suppress it. Sin is a lover. When the hated truth is suppressed, the loved lie is embraced. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they, that is those who suppress the truth, have darkened hearts. Claiming to be wise, they have become fools 
and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. They don't just bury truth, they embrace alternative lovers. There's no vacuum in the human heart, ever. When the real God is rejected, images are embraced. They exchanged the glory of God for images. Sin hates the true God and sin loves God substituting images. And we, more than any culture in the history of the world, live in an age of images. We spend almost all our leisure time looking at images. It's quite irrelevant, I think, that for Paul those images were stone or wood along the side of an Athenian road and ours are on our phone or television or computer. It's irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. The issue is substitution. They exchanged the infinitely valuable glory of God for the glory of that show of images coming off the screen. Now watch how Paul describes the relationship between this exchange of glory, this replacement of the true God, the suppression of the truth with the outpouring of sinning. So you've got suppression of the truth about the glory of God and the beneficence of God so that we don't have to glorify Him, we don't have to thank Him. And then the exchange, like, here's the glory of God. No, thank you. Image, please. I love this. I love this image. Glory of God. Don't want it. Now, what's the relationship between that and sinning? Verse 24. Therefore, wherefore? Namely, because of verse 23. Because of the exchange. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts or the desires of their hearts to impurity and to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So, because of the exchange of the glory of God for images, God goes hands off. And godlessness and unrighteousness of the human heart goes unrestrained into sinning. And lest we miss the connection between 23 and 24, here it comes again now in verses 24 and 25. Verse 24, the desires of their hearts run to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies, verse 25, because, so why does all that dishonoring of their bodies and why does all that impurity happen in the world? Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So the impurities of sinning have a root. Sinning is verse 24, the root is verse 25. They have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Sin hates the truth about God. Sin suppresses it. Sin exchanges it. And instead it loves, worships, and serves substitutes, images, creatures. M might be just the universe if you're a good astronomer or a physicist. You just worship the magnificence of the thing made, galaxies, but with all your might, suppress the truth that it was made by one who holds you accountable to worship him. 
Now we've seen it twice. Unless we missed those two, here it comes again. We've seen it in the connection between 23 and 24. We've seen it in the connection between 24 and 25. Here it is again between 25 and 26. How many times is he going to do it? I'll tell you, four. This is number three. Verse 26, for this reason, what reason? Well, for the reason of verse 25. Because we exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. So the flood of dishonorable passions in the world have a root, namely the suppression of truth, the exchange of the glory of God for substitutes. And please forgive Paul, but here he goes one more time to show us the connection between the root of our depravity and the flood of sins that flow from us all. So he does, it, he does it between 23 and 24, connection between 24 and 25, the connection between 25 and 26, and now look at the logic of verse 28. Since, or just as, they did not see fit. I'm going to come back to this translation. I don't like it. Since they did not see fit to have God in their um, did not see fit to, to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Now, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the ESV here, they did not see fit to acknowledge God. I think is a bland translation of words that would go more exactly with force like this. They did not approve, Dakimazo, of having God in their knowledge. That's really powerful. Not see fit to acknowledge God. Just they, they, they considered the possibility that God should be an integral, dominant part of their knowledge and they disapproved of it. That's sin. That's the essence of sin. I don't want you in my knowledge. No, I will not have you in my knowledge. And therefore, God gives them over to a debased mind to do, 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 do what ought not to be done. So notice two phrases, two crucial terms in that last phrase. Debased mind and do what ought not to be done. God hands them over, it says, to a debased mind. Debased. What, what's the historic theological word for that? Depraved. It's a good translation. It's a good word. If you wondered, if you ever wondered, where does that word depraved for human beings come from? Verse 28, God gives us over to a depraved mind, a base mind, a corrupted mind, a ruined mind. He gives us over to it. Because we disapprove of having God in our knowledge. And the other phrase that you need to feel the force of is, do what ought not to be done. God gave them up to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. So this depravity, this debased mind does things. It does things. Like all day long, it does things. So, there is action, doing, and there is root. There's the bottom. There's sin and there's sinning. And I'm arguing that we, at the bottom of our sinfulness, don't like the true and living God. We don't like Him. We suppress the truth that leads to Him. We exchange His glory for substitutes that we prefer 
We disapprove of having Him in our knowledge. We have a deep, unshakable, compelling preference for other things to God, everything to God. And that is the bottom. So, when we get to the juncture of Paul's shift from indictment and analysis to how did God save sinners, it's not surprising at verse 23 of chapter 3, a verse almost everybody in this room knows by heart, Romans 3.23, not surprising the way he said it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? The word fall short, hystereo, means lack. I translate it that way. All have sinned and lack the glory of God. Now, if you, if you lack something, you come short of it. Or if you come short of it, you lack it. But there are two ways you can come short of something, right? And here the issue is the glory of God. So, all have sinned, and I think he means, and in that, the nature of that, the essence of that, in that you have fallen short of or come short of the glory of God. But what what does that mean? Come short of the glory of God. Does it mean I should reflect and be more glorious like God and I'm coming short of my destiny to be in the image of God? Or does it mean I'm coming short of God as my treasure, God as my life, God as my all, God as my joy, my satisfaction. I'm coming short of having Him as my treasure. Which of those is it? (laughs) I've heard so many scholars over the years just opt for number one and go back and quote Genesis 1, you know, creating the image of God, supposed to represent Him, be His glory in the world. We're coming short of that destiny. I say, what? What about context? (laughs) Does it matter that Paul has just devoted Three chapters for this one? Of course, if you have God as your treasure, you will, according to Romans 8, 17, be glorified with Jesus. And you're not there yet. It's not wrong. It's just not the point in these chapters. I mean, how many times does he have to say it? Four times. That's how many times he has to say it. So, I believe what he is saying here is Romans 1.18. We suppress the truth about God and so fall short of it. Verse 21, we don't glorify him or thank him, so we come short of glorifying him and thanking him. Verse 23, we exchange the glory of God for images so we come short of embracing the glory of God and instead we embrace images. Verse 25, we exchange the truth about God for a lie and so we come short of embracing the truth and we worship and we stand in awe and serve the things that He's made and so we come short of worshiping God In verse 28, we disapprove of having God in our knowledge, and so we come short of having God in our knowledge as the the sun in our mental sky holding all the planets in orbit. We're short, we're short, we're short, we're short of having God as our glory, God as our treasure, God as our all. That's the drift of the chapters. So my definition of sinning goes like this. Sinning is any feeling or thought or speech or action that comes from a heart 
that does not treasure God over all things. Sin, ning, sins, actions called sins, are any thought, feeling, speech, action that come like fruit or branch, shoot out of the root of the heart that prefers anything to God. A few years ago, I attempted to define sin, therefore, like this. And this is the root, not the branch. Sin is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the promises of God not believed, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. Why is it that people become so emotionally and morally indignant over poverty, exploitation, prejudice, abortion, infractions of our religious liberty, manifold injustices of man to man, and feel little or no remorse or indignation or outrage that God is disregarded, disbelieved, disobeyed, dishonored, and thus belittled by millions and millions and millions of his creatures. And the answer to that question is sin. And that is the ultimate outrage in the universe that we don't treasure God above everything. And once Paul has made that clear, that the root of sinning is the preference of the human heart for anything to God, he now, in the rest of these first eight chapters, speaks of sin to show how pervasive and strong and deep and powerful it is in our lives. He speaks of it as reigning like a king in death, 521. He speaks of it as holding dominion like a lord, 614. He speaks of it as enslaving like a slave master, 66. He speaks of it as someone under whom we've been sold, 714, as a force that produces other sins, 7, 8, as a power that seizes the law and kills with it, 7, 11, as a hostile occupying tenant in believers dwelling in us, 7, 17, and 20, and as a law that takes us captive. This is a powerful thing. Very, very, very powerful. And defines you until you are born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 3, 6, Jesus said. And Paul adds, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So what we are, apart from the new birth, is flesh, and in that flesh, no good thing. The mind of the flesh, Romans 8, 7, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Why cannot it? Because it doesn't want to. It disapproves 
of having God and submitting to God and worshiping God and embracing God and treasuring God overall. Sin disapproves of that. And therefore, it cannot please God. Sin is not an alien thing in the unregenerate. It's not alien. Sin is our preference for anything over God. Sin is our disapproval of God. Sin is our exchange of His glory for substitute. Sin is our suppression of the truth of God. Sin is our heart's hostility to God. It is who we are at the bottom of our hearts until Christ. So, I ask now, in conclusion, was Westerholm right that such sinners cannot do any good deeds which they might then contribute to the foundation of their justification. Build hospitals, keep the speed limit, negotiate peace, heal diseases, feed the poor, pay a fair wage. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of them? Do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Authorities know what's good. The citizenry knows what's good. You do good, you won't go to jail, won't get fined. You bad, going to get swatted by the government. So what did Westerholm mean when he said human beings are incapable of doing good? Was he just wrong, and I wrong because I disagree with Because I agree with him? No. I wouldn't agree with him if I thought he was wrong. No, because there's another angle. There's one angle from which you can look at the deeds of human beings, and there's another angle that you can look at them in the Bible. Both angles are in the Bible. And the other angle starts here at Romans 3.10. None is righteous. No, not one. No one does good. Not even one. What does that mean? Well, Hebrews helps us a little bit. In chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Huh. So, unfaithers, unbelievers, can't please God. Period. And Paul says, Romans 14, 23, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So, all unbelievers do is sin. That's all they do. Because whatever doesn't come from faith is sin and cannot please God. So, the reason that some deeds of unbelievers are called good by you, by me, by Romans 13, is because often we use language to describe the prevailing viewpoint. That's the way the word good is generally used in the world, and we're going to communicate as we uh, strive to have certain laws passed or whatever, and we'll say uh, driving 55 is better than driving 95, and so that's a good law. we're We're going to use the word. Because the Bible uses the word and therefore warrants the common use of ordinary human language. But the Bible also describes things the way they are in reference to God, which pastors 
should care a lot about. That's our job. The world doesn't need any more social analysts who decide which laws are good and which laws are bad. The world needs people who stand up and say, God says it's not good for this reason. It's done out of unbelief. It will get you nowhere with the living God. You must have a Savior. You can't even do one good thing. If pastors don't talk like that, the Bible will lay powerless in their hands. Not committing adultery is a good thing. But if not committing adultery comes from a heart that has no love for God, which it does in millions of chaste spouses. If not committing adultery comes from a heart that has no love for God and a heart that does not treasure God above all things but treasures many things above God, the act of chastity is not an expression of love for God. It's not a way of expressing His value. It's a dishonor to God. He is neglected, ignored, maybe despised, but more than likely just not in the mental horizon of the chaste spouse. And therefore, that behavior is the fruit of God belittling unbelief. And therefore, Westerholm put it like this. Where God is not honored, something basic is awry. Spoiling even what would otherwise be good. Close quote. Now, for this to make any sense to your people or to you, we must cultivate in ourselves and in our people an absolutely radical God-centeredness. Just won't make sense any other way. We have to help our people think about everything in relation to God. So that God is central and supreme. If His glory and His honor are not uppermost in our affections, then God ignoring kindness and God ignoring truth-telling and God ignoring generosity won't be seen by your people as evil. So how are they going to make sense out of the doctrine of justification? If they think that humans are capable of so much good, like God ignoring kindness and God ignoring truth-telling and God ignoring generosity. They won't even have a category in their heads for such a thing. It only makes sense if God's glory is the all-defining, all-pervasive good value and beauty in the universe and nothing has good value and beauty apart from its relation to Him. The reason Paul says that whatever is not from faith is sin in Romans 14, 23 is that faith is a receiving of Christ and God in Christ as a desperately needed Savior, a Lord with whom we are happily compliant and a treasure that we esteem above Everything. I'll say that again, because a lot of you do not preach faith that way, and I want you to, because it's biblical. Faith is a receiving of Christ for all that He is. 
It's the receiving of Christ as a Savior I desperately need in my sin. Receiving of Him a Lord in whom I happily comply and a treasure that satisfies my soul and I treasure it above all other treasures in the world. That's what faith is. Therefore, whatever is not from faith is sin because Romans 1 to 3 said the root of sin is preferring anything to God, which faith doesn't do. Faith prefers God over all things. So here I am in Knoxville, Tennessee last summer, realizing as never before that a horrible and glorious thing was being shown me. The horrible and glorious truth that the reason my justification my right standing with God cannot be founded on 99.99% grace and Christ and 0.01% contribution of a good deed from unregenerate John Piper or regenerate John Piper is that there are no good deeds before regeneration. None. And after regeneration, they're all imperfect. So the question for the unbeliever is not, how many times have you heard people set this up? The question for the unbeliever is not, can I do enough good works to outweigh my bad works? (laughs) No. The question is, can I do one good work? And the answer is, no. (laughs) Which is why justification, our right standing with God has to be not 99.99% grace and Christ, but 100%. And that's the way He saved us. By grace alone, on the basis of Christ alone, through faith alone, to the glory of of God's infinite, beautiful, superior worth alone. And so I experienced as perhaps never before a devastation and a liberation and sweetness that I have been praying for you for a long time. Father, I ask now that as this conference moves forward and, and we go deeper, we go wider concerning sin, that exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything I have been able to imagine or anybody here been able to ask, you would do work in our soul paradoxical work, work we never dreamed could be done, a happier, sweeter, more toe-tapping liberty that we've ever known because we have faced for the first time, perhaps, our utter desolation as a God-suppressing, God-disapproving, God-exchanging rebel. Do that great work, I pray.